Turning our attention now to closing plenary, Latin American Energy Overview and CAET 2021 wrap up. Moderated by Julio Fernandez from Academia Nacional de Ingeniería, Uruguay. Welcome to the closing panel of CAES 2021 on the Latin American Energy Overview. My name is Julio Fernandez. I am president of the National Academy of Engineering of Uruguay and vice rector in Universidad Ort. First of all, I'd like to thank the National Academy of Engineering of Argentina for their organization of our meeting and for asking me to moderate this panel. Energy is a central resource for economic and human development. Latin America is rich in many energy resources, but it also has challenges, including the need to support a growing population and the demands of developing different industrial sectors as their economies grow and diversify. The huge variety of the region allows for different policies to address these challenges. Historically, fossil fuels have been the main energy source of our region, which is also rich in hydroelectric potential and is quickly developing other renewable sources. In some cases, renewables may be the only significant source available to produce more energy, but the replacement of fossil fuels is also becoming a powerful driver for renewable energy generation. Different paths and policies are being developed and deployed in order to meet these challenges. In this panel, we will first review developments in international agreements for emissions and then learn about the outlook and challenges of energy demand and supply for the region and for specific countries with special attention to alternatives and policies for future development. After all the recorded presentations, we will have a live question and answer session of about 15 minutes. I would like to encourage the audience to submit written questions to the panel through the Zoom chat during this meeting, and we will address questions after the presentation. Let me also remind you that a CV of each speaker is available in the website. Our first speaker, Madame Helen Plum, is Principal Analyst in the Ministry for the Environment of New Zealand. She has been at the forefront of the New Zealand government's domestic and international response to climate change since the beginning of global discussion to address the issue. She has represented New Zealand in almost every international climate negotiation ever held and has made significant contributions to the implementation of key international climate change agreements. She has chaired the climate change expert groups of OECD and the International Energy Agency. I must also thank Helen for adapting to the time differences. Her presentation will summarize the development and the current state of implementation of international agreements to reduce carbon emissions. Our second speaker is Mr. Alfonso Blanco. He is the Executive, Executive Secretary of OLADE, the Latin American Energy Organization, where he was re-elected for a second period in 2019. Mr. Blanco is an expert in the regional energy sector with more than 20 years of experience in implementing public policies, efficiency and renewable energies projects, and consulting for governments, international finance organization, and business. His presentations will address the outlook for energy production and demand in Latin America, the initiatives of OLADE, and his conclusions for public policy and for financing the development of the energy sector. Our next speaker will be Oscar Viñard. He is a chemical engineer, vice president of the National Academy of Engineering of Argentina, and a most distinguished representative of the chemical and petrochemical industry in the Latin American region. He has been an executive in Dow Chemical, holding positions in the US, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, where I believe he was one of the key persons in creating the Bahia Blanca petrochemical complex. Oscar has chaired the Argentine Chamber of Chemical and Petrochemical Industries and the Energy Department of the Argentine Industrial Union, among other professional and industrial organizations. May I also add that he's also one of the organizers of this meeting, CAES 2021. 
our next speaker will be Mario Menel da Cunha. He's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Engineering and a specialist in electrical power systems with an outstanding professional and public service career. He has been a director of CELEX, the power utility of Santa Catarina State, a member of the board of Electrosul, and a professor in the Federal University of Santa Catarina, besides serving in the state government and in the Brazilian federal executive. He has also been a director of several professional associations, including the Association of Engineers of Santa Catarina. He will present an outlook of energy production and consumption in Brazil, along with forecasts and perspectives. The next speaker will be Jose Luis Fernandez Sayas, who is a member and past president of the Mexican Academy of Engineering. He has been a professor and researcher in the Institute of Engineering of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, since 1975, publishing more than 30 books and hundreds of papers, and a director of the National System of Researchers of CONACYT. He was a director of research and environment in the Mexican Secretary of Energy, a founder of the National Association for Solar Energy, and a member and executive of several professional associations. Currently, he is a director of the Institute for Electrical Research. His presentation will address projections of energy demand and production in Mexico with attention to the role of renewables. Uh, the, last, the last panelist, Federico Ferrez, is a Uruguayan economist who has worked since 2009 in the development, financing, construction, and operation of renewable energy projects in Uruguay, Argentina, and Colombia from greenfield to operation. He's a member of the Honorary Council of the Observatory of Energy in the Catholic University of Uruguay. His presentation will cover recent transformations of the energy sector in Uruguay and the challenges of the future. As I said before, after this presentation, we will address the question received through the Zoom chat. I encourage you to submit written questions through the chat. After the question and answer session, we will have the closing remarks by Manuel Solanet, the president of the CAETS Organizing Committee and of the Argentine Academy of Engineers. Thanks. It is a great pleasure to be here today. I have had several decades experience with development and implementation of the reporting and review processes under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC or the Convention, the Kyoto Protocol, and most recently the Paris Agreement. I have also served on the Bureau of the Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. In particular, at the time that the 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories were being developed and finalized. I'm using a transparency lens for this presentation on international agreements to reduce carbon emissions covering the evolution of reporting and review under the UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement, built on the premise, you can't man manage what you don't measure. It's useful to go back in time to 1990. As a result of the Second World Climate Conference and the first scientific assessment by the IPCC, Negotiations were launched by the UN General Assembly on what would become the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Framework Convention on Climate Change was finalized in 1992 and opened for signature at the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in June 1992 and entered into force in March 1994. Its ultimate objective is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Such a level to be achieved 
within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. There is a lot more to the UNFCCC than its ultimate objective, covering commitments for all parties to regularly report national greenhouse gas inventories using comparable methodologies, and these became the methodologies for national greenhouse gas inventories produced by the IPCC. Secondly, to formulate measures to address emissions and removals of greenhouse gases. To communicate to the Conference of the Parties, the COP, information related to implementation. And to promote and cooperate on a range of relevant matters, including technology development and transfer, the conservation and enhancement of greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs, in preparing for adaptation to the impacts of climate change, on research and systematic observation, and information exchange, education, training, and public awareness. Developed countries had additional commitments, including aiming to return to 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2000, communicating progress to this end within six months of entry into force of the convention and periodically thereafter, and providing financial resources and technology transfer to assist developing countries meet their commitments, as well as assisting developing country parties adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. Significantly, at the first conference of the parties, COP1 in Berlin in 1995, it was agreed that the com commitments in the convention were not sufficient to meet its objective and that negotiations would commence on legally binding targets for developed countries. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was finalized at COP3 in Kyoto, Japan. It contained legally binding targets for developed countries, as well as new ways of meeting targets through the use of the three Kyoto market-based mechanisms, international emissions trading, joint implementation, and the clean development mechanism. Because of the legally binding nature of the targets, a more stringent reporting and review system was required, including the need to establish national systems for greenhouse gas inventories, Robust, these are robust domestic arrangements that would produce reliable information for greenhouse gas and target reporting. Several years were needed to develop the necessary reporting and review guidelines, which happened in parallel with the development of other rules and guidelines, the broader Kyoto rule set, that would allow an operational Kyoto protocol once it entered into force. The rules and guidelines for reporting and review under the Kyoto Protocol, amongst the broader rule set, were largely finalized at COP7 in Marrakesh in 2001, ready for adoption at the first meeting of the parties under the Kyoto Protocol that took place in Montreal in 2005. These reporting and review guidelines were put into practice before the beginning of the first commitment period when developed countries had to submit initial reports for review prior to a signed amount being issued into national registries, which were established to record holdings of units used in the market-based mechanisms under the Kyoto Protocol. Many safeguards were built into the system, including the functioning of national inventory and national registry systems, how the review process would work for both greenhouse gas inventories, allowing for adjustments to be made for accounting purposes, for example, if a party had underestimated its emissions, and about how international emissions trading would work. The ability to trade was dependent on parties maintaining robust national systems. As a result, the reporting and review process was taken very seriously as there were compliance consequences. The most serious of which was arguably the suspension of the ability to participate in the Kyoto Protocol's market-based mechanisms, and for the party concerned, could have had impacts on achievement of its target. There were further transparency developments between 2009 and 2012 as parties grappled with what a second commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol might look like, together with looking at the possibility of a new global agreement. Of significance is the Copenhagen Accord. 
This was only noted by COP15 held in Copenhagen in 2009. And for many, this seemed at the time to be a disappointing outcome. However, the Copenhagen Accord laid the groundwork for much that followed. For example, it referred to limiting warming to no more than two degrees that parties cooperate in achieving the peaking of global and national emissions as soon as possible, and the role of low emission development strategies. Importantly for the theme of this presentation, the introduction of biennial update reports from developing countries can also be sourced back to the Copenhagen Accord, with mitigation actions to be subject to domestic measurement reporting and verification, that's known as MRV, together with provisions for international consultations and analysis under clearly defined guidelines. There was further elaboration of reporting requirements as part of the Cancun agreements at COP16 in 2010, which set in train a process to elaborate guidelines for biennial reports together with international assessment and re review for developed countries, alongside guidelines for biennial update reports together with international consultations and analysis for developing countries. These sets of guidelines were finalized at COP17 in Durban, the same meeting that launched the process to develop a protocol, another legal instrument or an agreed outcome with legal force under the convention applicable to all parties. This resulted in the Paris Agreement adopted at COP21 in December 2015. Each of these decisions led to incremental improvements to the international processes for parties to report on their actions to address climate change, as well as keep track of domestic emissions and removals through the reporting of regular greenhouse gas inventories. It is also important to recall that through the period 2003 to 2006, and then again from 2016 to 2019, the IPCC, through its Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, was working on developing and improving the scientifically based methodologies that countries use for calculating greenhouse gas emissions and removals at the national level. The scientific basis for estimating greenhouse gas emissions and removals is a fundamental component of both national and international reporting. And the much quoted IPCC TAC principles, and these are transparency, accuracy, completeness, consistency, and comparability are a fundamental component of the international reporting and review landscape. And the Paris Agreement is no exception. The IPCC approach to national greenhouse gas inventories is underpinned by a philosophy of continuous improvement through time. The Enhanced Transparency Framework established as part of the Paris Agreement provides for all countries, that's developed and developing, to report on actions taken and progress made in climate change mitigation, adaptation measures and support provided or received as applicable. The Enhanced Transparency Framework also includes international procedures for the review of the submitted reports. The information gathered through the Enhanced Transparency Framework will feed into the five yearly global stock takes under the Paris Agreement, which will assess the collective progress towards achieving the purpose of the agreement and its long-term goals. As already mentioned, the TAC principles are embedded in the modalities, procedures and guidelines, the MPGs, for the Enhanced Transparency Framework that were agreed by parties to the Paris Agreement in December 2018. For the first time since agreement to the Framework Convention on Climate Change back in 1992, all parties will be using common guidelines, including IPCC methodological guidance for their reporting. The development of these MPGs was very much informed by the experience of parties with the transparency arrangements under the Convention, including biennial reports, biennial update reports and national communications. The MPGs also reflect that parties have different starting points and building on a provision in the Paris Agreement itself, the MPGs contain specific flexibilities available to those developing country parties that need flexibility in light of their capacities. 
the importance of facilitating improved reporting and transparency over time is one of the guiding, guiding principles of the MPGs alongside providing flexibility to those developing country parties that need it in light of their capacities, promoting TAC, avoiding duplication of work and undue burden on parties and the Secretariat, ensuring that parties maintain at least the frequency and quality of reporting in accordance with their respective obligations under the Convention, ensuring double counting is avoided, and ensuring environmental integrity. The Enhanced Transparency Framework sits at the heart of the Paris Agreement. It has also been described as the backbone of the Paris Agreement. Perhaps it is both. It is through the Enhanced Transparency Framework that each party makes itself accountable to all other parties. It provides for parties to hold each other to account in a reciprocal way. Each party is expected to provide information on how it is tracking towards achievement of its nationally determined contribution, its NDC. First biennial transparency reports are due for submission by 2024, at which point the review and accountability process starts. Before then, we need to conclude preparations for an effective and operational transparency system including building the capacity of developing countries to fully engage in this process. You can't manage what you can't measure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for Alade to be part of the CAET 2021. Uh, our presentation will be regarding Latin American energy matrix and the regional overview and future future developments of the uh, Latin American energy, energy and the Caribbean energy energy sector. Olade has all the uh, official information of the energy sector uh, from our 27 uh, member member countries. Every year we prepare the. Uh, Latin American and the Caribbean Energy Outlook, and the last uh, version of the uh, our outlook was 2020, with information of 2019. In 2019, the uh, Latin American energy sector had 30% of oil in uh, the primary energy, 33% of natural gas, 6% of coal, 8% uh, of hydro energy and uh, more than 21% of uh, other primary energies considering biomass and other renewables. What is the uh, most important issue to highlight of our uh, uh, region is that in comparison with the rest of the world, the uh, participation of renewables is higher than in primary energy in comparison with the with the rest of the of, of the world, our region has 29% of renewable ener energies in the primary energy energy sources, in comparison with the 13% around 13% 13, 13 of the uh, rest rest of the world. The other uh, particular issue that I want to highlight is the low participation of the coal in the uh, primary energy energy resources, and uh, the other uh, particular issue is the a very high penetration of the hydro energy and biomass in comparison with the rest of the world. If we consider the final energy uh, consumption by uh, sectors, the transport sectors, uh, sector has 38% of the uh, final consumption of uh, energy in our region and 29% of industries. The residential sector is around 16%. I want to uh, talk about the, uh, the evolution in our region of the uh, energy access and the correlation that has uh, the energy access with the uh, human development uh, indexes. Our region has uh, around 97% of the electricity uh, connections of our, our population, uh, the electricity access is 97%. And we have, uh, we, we have around 18 million people without access to electricity in our region. But if we compare these figures with the uh, 
the the amount of uh, people without access in uh, two, two, 20 years ago uh, that amount was higher than 50 million people without without access and our region had a very important advance in the universal energy access of our our population and uh, in the improvement of the human development uh, indicators. And that is uh, the correlation that I mentioned uh, before. The energy as access has a very important correlation with the human development uh, indicators and our region had reached a, a very important result, result uh, regarding, regarding the energy, uh, energy access during the uh, the last 20, 20 years. Let's uh, talk about the uh, total primary energy supply uh, in comparison with the world and, and uh, our, our region. If we compare the, the total primary energy supply, the main difference is the participation of coal in the primary energy matrix. The rest of the world has 27% of the coal, partici of coal participation in the primary energy uh, supply, and our region has 6%. And the other particular issue to be highlighted is the uh, high penetration of renewables. The renewables, considering hydro and the rest of renewables, has 29% of uh, participation in comparison in comparison with the with the rest of the world that is around uh, 13 13 percent and that is uh, 12 12 percent that and that is the main the the main difference uh, between between our region and the rest of the world what is the uh, role of the uh, final energy consumption by by source if we compare the evolution of our our region in the final energy energy consumption. Uh, the participation of the, uh, of the oil and the, the derivatives in the final energy and energy consumption were 50% in 1970s and now it's 53%. But the uh, advances of the natural gas that was 6% six, 6 in 1970s and now is 12%. And the uh, the uh, increase of the uh, electricity in the final energy consumption. consumption. We moved from 6% to say, 18, 18%. And the, what were the, the final energy consumption that had the most important uh, evolution was the biomass, uh, because in the, in the 70s, the role of the bio biomass in the uh, residential sector were very high, and now we had 13 percent of the biomass uh, used in the final energy energy con uh, energy consumption. Let's talk about the renewability index and the evolution during the uh, last 20, 20, 20 years in the Latin American energy sector. The primary, uh, if we consider the primary energy uh, supply, we have 29 percent of renewability. Uh, and if we consider the final energy and energy supply, we have 26 percent percent in the renewability index. But this index doesn't have any uh, variation during the last uh, 20 years. And that was because our region had a very high development of the uh, hydropower generation during the uh, final 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. And that was uh, part of the very important advance in the renewability in our in, in, in our region. Now we are incorporating uh, non-conventional renewable uh, energies, but the rate uh, uh, that we are incorporating that, that kind of energy is uh, lower than the rate that uh, the uh, final uh, electricity demand is increasing. And we are incorporating renewables in a, a less uh, rate than the uh, increase of the of the demand in our in our region. Uh, the installed power uh, generation in our in our region we have 
45% uh, uh, of hydro in the stored capacity. And that is the main uh, important issue to, to highlight in our, in our region if we consider the, ele the, the electricity sector. Uh, if we consider the uh, renewables uh, installed capacity in our region is 58.5%. And we have to include hydropower generation, geothermal, wind, and solar in uh, all the uh, installed capacity in, uh, power, in uh, renewables power generation. If we compare with the rest of the world, the rest of the world has 27% of renewability in the uh, installed capacity in the power, in the power generation. Uh, 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 we are talking uh, in this uh, slide uh, considering the uh, energy energy uh, production not 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 the installed capacity so uh, the evolution of the power generation we we have to highlight that the during the last five five years the incorporation of non-conventional renewable ener energies uh -huh. in the uh, regional ener energy matrix had a very important uh, uh, pen penetration and that is that is the a evolution of the power generation in our in a, in our in our region, and that is the role that uh, we have to uh, in the in, in the main ob objective of the RELAG initiative. The RELAG initiative is to increase from fifty eight percent of uh, renewability in the power generation up to seventy percent by two thousand twenty twenty thirty, and that is an important advance in the incorporation of uh, renewable power power generation in our in our region. That is a very ambitious initiative that, that we share with the IDB, other partners agency, and is leading by Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, and other, and other countries. And we have the goal to increase the uh, renewable energies, uh, power, uh, power generation up to 70% by uh, 2030. But there are a lot of uh, existing barriers and we have to develop different strategies for each particular country in order to leverage the existing barriers for the renewables energy uh, energies in our in our region. And uh, we develop a lot of forecasts uh, regard, regarding regarding the uh, role of the renewables in order to reach the goal of uh, 70 20 percent of uh, power. Uh, renewables power power generation in our ener energy matrix we have a lot of benefits uh, considering considering the co2 emissions in our in, a, in our region if we uh, increase the uh, install capacity up to 70 percent but that will need a lot of invest investment in our in our region in order in order to reach the objective uh, the situation are completely different if we consider if we consider the countries of the Latin American uh, uh, Latin American region, and uh, but the uh, technologies uh, we don't need uh, pilot projects because we have lessons learned in our, in all our region regarding the incorporation of uh, renewables in the power in the power generation. Uh, we need the role of the uh, of the government in order to develop long-term energy policies, establish the uh, rules in order and leverage all the existing uh, existing barriers in uh, our uh, in our in our region. Uh, I, I want I want to highlight an, a, a final a, a final issue. Uh, I, I talked about uh, a lot about uh, renewables, but the role of the natural gas in the uh, future uh, Latin American energy energy matrix will be crucial and will be part of the uh, acceleration of the decarbonization of the uh, uh, Latin American energy energy matrix. We have to also consider the role of the uh, hydrogen and the production of uh, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen in our in our region. We have to consider additionally the uh, the changes in the final energy energy use, uh, considering the the electric mobility and uh, other other technologies uh, to 
the, for the substitution of uh, fossil fossil fuels in transport and in the power in the power generation uh, power generation too. And we have to consider the uh, emerging technologies, energy storage, the uh, digitalization of the energy sector as the main drivers of the energy sector in the Latin American. Uh, in Latin America, we need to improve a lot of issues. We have to work in the regulatory frameworks. We have to work in long-term energy policies. We have to support uh, our member countries in the development of the energy energy strategies. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are completely open to share our information, and we have we are completely open to. Uh, to uh, support support our member member countries in any uh, particular issue that uh, should be could be considered for the development of the energy sector in the in the region. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning. Good evening. I'm Oscar Vignar, member of the Argentine Academy of Engineering, ANI, and will present you today the Argentine Energy Profile. I would like to thank the ANI Energy Institute for their contribution to this presentation, especially Gustavo Irasu for his valuable comments. A demanding geography from the energy supply side a continental area of 2.8 million square kilometers, second only to Brazil in Latin America, a north-south dimension of 3,600 kilometers as seen in the map, with changing climates, subtropical in the north, temperate weather in the center, and very cold winters in the south, a formidable mountain barrier in the west, the Andes, and great rivers in the northeast, the Paraná and Uruguay, both discharging in the Atlantic Ocean through the River Plate. Around 45 million inhabitants, which gives a very low population density, 16.2 people per square kilometer, similar to Canada and Australia. With an additional factor, 93% lives in urban areas, with a large concentration of people around the city of Buenos Aires close to 13 million. So distances, weather variations, geographic obstacles, and even population distribution creates challenging conditions for the design and operation of the energy system. Let's look now at today's total energy supply system. Natural gas is the predominant source of energy, 59.5%. Oil reaches 26.4% and is mainly used for transportation. A minimum coal contribution, 0.9%. Zero carbon sources, total 13.2%. And this includes hydro, nuclear, and others. Our history shows natural gas growing and displacing oil as the main energy source from 1860 on building in this period a large gas pipeline infrastructure, thousands of kilometers of major lines built from the south and the north, from west to east, reaching finally the Buenos Aires cosmopolitan area. The power generation pictures shows a more diversified structure with natural gas still an important source. Fossil fuels accounts for roughly 60%, and zero carbon sources for the remaining 40%, mainly hydropower, although nuclear and wind have an important participation. Nevertheless, among fossil fuels, gas is the prevailing one, which helps to reduce the carbon impact. Argentina has more than 110 years of history with oil and gas, over 70 years of natural gas exploitation with five productive basins, Northwest, Cuyana, Neuquina, San Jorge and Austral, and a major gas reservoir discovery in 1977 in the province of Neuquén, Loma de la Lata. The latest developments 
the discovery of unconventional oil and gas resources have changed the local hydrocarbon scenery. Neuquén is today the center of unconventional natural gas and oil production, with several companies operating in the Vaca Muerta field, translated as dead cow, for the basin shape, similar to the size of Belgium. Today, we are at a critical point. We need to define if we are going to develop this incredible resource to its available potential, satisfying not only local gas needs, but becoming a regional gas exporter and a source of LNG, maybe green LNG, combined with nature-based solutions, as was seen in Mr. Fragio's presentation in session three. A major decision within a narrow window of opportunity needs to be taken soon, and clearly this decision will need to be part of the country energy plan for the coming decades. Another key development in Argentina has been the construction and operation of three nuclear power plants based on natural uranium and heavy water, under construction and design by the Argentine Nuclear Agency, CONEA. We have current 25, a small modular reactor that was described in session two. Getting into renewable energies, the country has a very strong potential to develop both wind and solar power. You will see in this map high average wind speeds, and you will notice two areas with excellent conditions, Patagonia in the south and the southern part of the Buenos Aires province. The sun irradiance data shows outstanding conditions for power generation in the northwest of the country. Since 2016, an incepting program was launched to build renewable power plants based on wind, solar, small hydrons, biomass, and biogas, with excellent results as it can be seen in the graph. Wind and solar were the predominant projects. The program target is to reach 20% of power generation by 2025. In this slide, you can see the geographical distribution of these new projects. Due to the fact that renewable power plants are not located near the demand, transmission becomes the bottleneck of the system. New power lines will be needed as we expand the installation of renewable resources. You will notice here the impact on new projects executed lately as a percentage of total power consumption. Another key country resource is the availability of lithium reserves in the northwest of the country, discussed in detail in session three. Let's look now at the country emissions from fossil fuel combustion. 183 million tons of CO2 or 0.55 of equivalent world emissions. On the right side, you can see that transportation and power generations accounts for 50% of total emissions, with industrial and residential reaching 34%. The country has committed to a 2030 target of 360 million tons of carbon dioxide as total, as total emissions, coming down from 570 million in 2005. This is their national defined contribution. Probably this target could be changed in Glasgow next November in COP26. Now, what can the country do to achieve this goal and the more challenging objectives of 250 and 260? Let's look at the available resources. A rich agenda of opportunities. We have tremendous wind and solar uh, capabilities. We have the possibility to develop a small and medium hydros. But together with all this development, we have to remember we will need to build transmission lines, install batteries, and clearly use demand energy, demand management energy, to handle these special conditions. 
we already talked about the developments of Vaca Muerta and the possibilities of LNG exports. We have a tremendous potential in generating hydrogen, a fuel that will have an important role in the future, both green and blue with carbon capture storage. We already mentioned the possibilities to build small modular reactors for atomic generation, for nuclear generation, a technology that is very easily adapted to our distributed needs of energy around the country. We also have possibilities to build third generation reactors together with the existing in the place where we have today two nuclear reactors in Atucha. There will be a need to build infrastructure to support electron mobility. And there is a lot of work to be done to improve the efficiency in industry, homes, buildings, and services. And we already talked about the lithium possibilities of the Northwest of the country. How to prioritize them? How to combine them? What are the most efficient economical routes to decarbonize the economy? What incentives and regulations are needed? How to invest millions of dollars in a major revolutionary change at a speed never experienced before that will change the way we live? And how to minimize the social and economic impact? How to finance it? a very complex set of questions and challenges for any country. In our case, we need to overcome some long lasting problems before we can seriously tackle this formidable job. The country needs to achieve economic and financial stability. It cannot grow with the 40, 50% level of inflation. We need to lower the cost of capital. We are talking of very large projects. A critical condition can only be achieved after complying with the previous point. Stable and acceptable rules and regulations that cannot be modified with every change of government. An accepted consensus beyond who's in power. We need also to make public-private cooperation a reality and long-term financial from world financial institutions and private sources. There is a tremendous opportunity to design and build our way into the future of energy. Let's don't lose it. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be at this important event representing National Academy of Engineering, Academia Nacional de Engenharia, ANI, from Brazil. I would like to present a vision of the future of the Brazilian energy metrics. Our energy metrics has a high percentage of uh, renewable energy and projections indicated that until 2030, this will continue. There is a reduction of supply of oil and due to environmental issues, a reduction of hydroelectric production, while the supply of natural gas is increased. Our electrical metrics is much more renewable than the energy metrics, a trend that will remain the same over the next 10 years. In relation to the national grid load in uh, intermediate reference scenario, this one here, that is the, the, the most likely, uh, we have a timid growth compatible with the growth of GDP and per capita consumption. The greatest growth occurs in Southeast Middle West region, where the state of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and the capital Brasilia are located. Load behavior is noteworthy. Using 2019 as a reference, the blue line, 
due to the pandemic, we have a big drop in 2020, the black line, and a recovery of more than 10% in 2021. Given the severe water crisis that the country is currently going through, the increasing load has become a parameter of concern for sector managers since, as shown before, our metrics is very dependent on water. The energy situation is worrying when one observes the affluent flows shown in the graph, which points to values below long-term average for the last seven years. The immediate consequence is that in this, in this uh, seven years, we have had a GSF, generator scaling factor, lower than one, which means the application of penalties for hydro generators. The water crisis can be better understood when we look at Iguazu Falls, which are part of the Paraná Basin, Brazil's main producer of hydroelectric energy. The first photo is a medium flow situation. As the waters are clear, in the middle of the rain, rainy season, in addition to the volume of water, they become very clay colored. In the second thought, this one, currently the falls appear with a trickle of water. It means no water in Iguazu Falls, almost no water. Now let's uh, talk about uh, the features of Brazilian interconnect system. We are going to talk about the transmission system, distributed generation, wind excellence, and mark opening. The transmission system is very robust. Almost 150,000 kilometers of lines up to 800 kV and covers almost the whole of Europe. The auctions for the construction of new transmission lines carried out with resource and private private guarantees have shown excellent results, ensuring compliance with the schedule for, the, for opening the new lines. The robustness of transmission lines is it, it's very important for us because allows for the transfer of energy resources from one region to another. For instance, in the north, we have water resource, large hydroelectric plants such as Giral, Santo Antonio, Belo Monte, and Tucuruí. Northeast, we have a lot, of, a lot of good wind and solar. And in Southeast and Midwest, we have water and biomass. And finally, in the south part of the country, we have coal, wind, and water. Taking advantage of this seasonality, seasonality and complementarity of each such. Distributed generation. It was so important, important growth as a result of the initi initial incentives, like you can see in the graph. But now the future growth depends on the regulatory framework that is under discussion in the National Congress, which has tendency to reduce current incentives. As a requirement, the generating unity must be less than five megawatts and be located within the concession area where the consumption unit is located. By fulfilling these requirements, the unit is entitled to incentives such as compensation of self-produced energy and the discount of the use of distribution system. The excellence of winds. The quality of the winds, especially in the Northeast, is an excellent fact that provide average capacity factors of around 60% in 2020. 
to compare the global average is 34%. Also, it is possible to predict with reasonable accuracy the Brazilian winds, making the life of the ISO much easier. Mark opening. There are regulations for the full opening of the market and proposal to advance the schedule. Although the free market, today about 30% of the total market, represents a cost reduction for the consumer of about around, around 20%, there are many details to be resolved for the full opening, such as legacy contracts and last resort supply. Now let's talk about the near future. Hybrid plants, hydrogen and smart grids. Hybrid, hybrid plants. There are several possibilities of complementarity between sources, but the most evident is between solar and wind sources. The advantage of the arrangement lies on in the savings provided by the reduction in the contract for the use of the transmissions, transmission system. Now let's talk about smart grids. Let's talk about Copel. It's a concessionaire of the state of Paraná in the southern part of the country. They are implementing a smart grid program that covers a large part of the state, Paraná in the southern part of the, the Brazil. Results have been excellent with improvement in all power supply quality indices. In fact, at the end of this year, it already even exists smart cities like União da Vitória. Next photo. It's not a big city, but it's an important city in the state of Paraná. Now let's go about the hydrogen. Preliminary studies which indicate high level of competitiveness for green hydrogen made in Brazil led the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Energy to prepare the National Hydrogen Plan, which will officially launch next August. Even without the plan's guidelines, multinational companies have announced investments for now in the studies and pilot plants located in Ceará, green hydrogen, and Rio de Janeiro, blue hydrogen. The competitiveness we can see in this graph to the right side. Well, uh, there are many developments are happening in Brazilian electric sector right now, but the time was too short to address them all. Anyway, I remain available for clarification of doubts. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for the invitation to the Mexican Academy of Engineering, which is a founding member of CAITS, our co-host, together with the Argentina National Academy of Engineering. I heed the instructions of our Mexican Academy president and will present you with a novel business proposition in the field of energy. This proposal is open to all countries and will require a very sizable number of engineers in many fields of knowledge, well beyond energy. Firstly, a few data to put us in the overall relevant numbers. Mexico has over 3,000 kilo, uh, square kilometers, almost 2,000 uh, miles, uh, border length with the United States of America, the most powerful world economy and a proven dynamic business partner to, to us. Mexico is a developing economy with a per capita GDP of about $10,000, but very unevenly distributed. It is richer, this country is richer than uh, 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 in, in the northern parts of the, of, of, of the, of the map we are, we are seeing, but it's much poorer than the United States or Canada. The uh, southern part of Mexico is poorer in uh, where we have the most indigenous population. 
let me show you a few trends uh, related to, to energy for the last 30 years. Both graphs on the right, as you are looking at them, uh, electricity consumption and CO2 release grow constantly for the last 30 years. However, energy production reached a peak in 2004 and is declining. A vast proportion of gas and petrol are imported and the quantities keep rising. Once we were a heavy oil exported, but now this country endures a very severe energy deficit. A quick look at the principal energy sources during the last decades shows that dependence on oil, which is uh, depicted in orange, is slowly decreasing. Demand for natural gas, which is mostly imported from Texas and shown in blue, is slowly increasing as well. These are bad news for Mexican engineering and for the Mexican economy. The small hydro fraction plus other non-polluting energy sources are still small and altogether accounting for about a 15% of the total. We make poor use of our splendid solar and wind energy natural renewable sources. Furthermore, the total energy delivered in terawatt hours, as is shown in the graph, is stalling without a major shift in energy efficiency nor energy intensity. But the overall picture, when projected into the future, looks less bleak according to the International Energy Agency and McKinsey, the consultancy, among others. The data that follows has been documented in many ways and seems to be accurate and reliable. A sample from a 2019 forecast shows that the arrival of photovoltaic generators is increasing very rapidly although the fraction of the total energy offer is still very small, of about 1% of the total energy generated in the country. Recent pressure, pressure from the private sector might forecast an acceleration of these technologies in the not so distant future. And consequently, capital requirements to 2030 are of the same size as the total energy infrastructure built up over the last century. Furthermore, a technology shift towards more efficient production, transmission and distribution is foreseeable. Cleaner and renewable options are arriving quickly and are here to stay. I am afraid our national capacities, both technical and financial, are very much overburdened and we must cry for international help. The coupling of the expected surge in international demand for clean energy across our northern border, together with an increase in size of international markets demanding sustainable industrial processes, plus the Mexican uh, weather and low labor costs, might forecast a very large portion of solar energy technologies within 30, 30 years. For example, an average mechanical designer or an infrastructure maintainer technician will earn in Mexico less than a third what they get uh, in, the, in the northern countries in North America. Even if the total energy demand is growing at a faster rate than population, during the last few years, and total energy demand, as shown, uh, uh, is uh, a gr a gr a growing at a, an unsustainable rate, a clear turnaround can be expected and the exponential growth can be flattened out and recover the most plausible rates of growth that Mexico had until the end of World War II. As McKinsey puts it, the exponential growth can correct itself to accommodate economic growth and sustainability needs in the shown S curve, uh, which is depicted in blue in, in this graph. The forecast shown here can only be achieved if we can forge a positive international cooperation 
where each nation contributes with its best resources and comparative advantages. I believe Mexico's future is bright and sunny. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in the Council of Academies of Engineering and Techno Technological Sciences. I would like, would like to discuss today about the future of energy, and in particular, the future of energy in my country, in Uruguay. When it comes to energy, a lot has changed in the last few years, and a lot will change in the next few years. We would like to visualize the great opportunity that Uruguay has as a green energy producer and exporter. Uruguay had great success in decarbonizing the electricity sector. In just 15 years, the electricity generation went from almost zero participation of unconventional renewables to almost 60% last year. This increase in the share of renewables in the electricity source came with a lower cost of energy. The cost of generating one megawatt decreased by 45%. Before renewables installations, Uruguay almost had massive, massive blackouts and had millions of dollars in additional costs needed to purchase electricity from Brazil and Argentina at more than $400 per megawatt hour and to purchase oil to produce electricity. This kind of vulnerabilities repeated every two to four years in 2006, 2008, 2012. In 2012, for example, the yearly cost of generating electricity was $1,151 million compared to 304 just two years before. There was huge volatility year by year. Due to biomass, wind and solar, Uruguay became more sustainable, more resilient, and at the same time, more competitive, producing our own energy and even exporting exceeding capacity. From 2015 to 2019, 96.5% of the electricity supply came from renewable resources, including hydro. Uruguay even became a net exporter of electricity, as you see on this picture. These are two spot moments where we have fully renewable generating capacity and we were exporting a lot to Brazil and Argentina. This transformation was possible due to huge investment in renewable, approximately $3.5 billion in five-year period, driven by a legal framework in which private investors could rely on. Certainty was the key. A priority dispatch was available for renewals, we have 20 years PPA in US dollars with the utility. This contract was with a take or pay clause. And Uruguay has very solid and consistent, very solid credit and consistent energy policy. It is worth noting that this energy, energy transition has been developed without subsidies. Current circumstances create a great base for a new challenge to further decarbonize other sectors, like industry, transport, and why not agriculture. And at the same time, help companies to maintain or improve its competitiveness. Global, global climate challenge is another factor to take into consideration. Climate crisis has, be tackled, has to be tackled globally and Uruguay has to be part of the solution. Energy-related emissions are approximately 70% of the total emissions in the world. The energy system will be at the core of the transition to a more sustainable world. New investments are needed in the world in order to decarbonize the energy sectors. High percentage of the fossil fuel consumption will need to change to renewables to meet the commitment 
to, to, to meet the commitments to the, reduce the emissions. According to ARENA, this will mean that electricity demand will grow three to four times from today's level, which generates big opportunities for the most competitive countries. Uruguay has to be ambitious and responsible. We have the opportunity to be a first mover, setting ambitious goals with creative solutions in a country that has almost unlimited green resources for its size. We as a country have a big challenge to be as competitive as possible while helping the globe tackle the climate crisis that is facing. If we are innovative and creative enough, we can be even become a net exporter of energy, something completely unthinkable two years ago, as it was unthinkable 20 years ago that, Ur that Uruguay could become a net exporter of electricity. Which are the main drivers? for these changes. First, technology. Technology has changed greatly and will continue to change in the next few years. <clears throat> the cost decline of renewables has been astonishing and wind and solar has become really competitive, paving the way to more renewables. Second, well, the, sorry, this same cost decline will be seen on the battery electric vehicles, the batteries, electrolyzers, and other technologies. Second driver is consumer pressure. Consumers realize that climate is an issue that has to be handled today. Tomorrow may be too late. Third driver, regulation and tax policy. The EU, the US, Japan, and even China had plans to eliminate its carbon footprint. These countries and regions are changing regulations and taxes schemes to promote reaching net zero emissions in the next 20 to 30 years. Last but not least, financial institutions requirements. Financial institutions requirements means better access and better conditions to credit. These three issues, consumer pressures, consumer pressure, regulation, and better financing are huge incentives to take this challenge seriously. Each country has to find a way, a solution, a path to decarbonize. The solution will not be the same for the different markets or countries. Technology alternatives are plenty. There is a key question, which is the best solution for our country, for our sector, for our company? It is important to understand the brutal facts, the brutal changes, and adapt our demand, adapt our regulation, and adapt our way of thinking. The most important fact to be considered in Uruguay is that variable renewables are dominating our power supply and that the operation of a power system with a high share of variable renewals requires much higher flexibility on demand. Demand side flexibility offers interesting possibilities as the electrification trends results in new loads connected to the system, such as electric vehicles, behind the meter batteries, heat pumps, electrolyzers which if operated, operated smartly can support grid balancing. What is needed? What does Uruguay need to go ahead on the decarbonization? We need a concrete set of policies, of policy actions, regulations, tax policy, among others, that brings cost-effective path to decarbonization and face the, main, the three main challenges, cost, security of supply, and CO2 reduction. In particular, we need more investments. New investments are needed in order to decarbonize the energy sector, such as battery electric vehicles, hydrogen, etc. Investment in energy intensive industries with flexible, flexible demand. 
that at the same time we attract new investment in more renewables. We need we need to reevaluate existing assets, mainly grid, in particular transmission and distribution lines, in order to develop a plan to maximize the use of existing grid capabilities with no, no additional cost to the utility. We need to reevaluate capacity market with a whole energy system approach, considering supply side and demand side. In particular, to recognize the, capa the capacity of renewables and batteries to give power during critical hours and to reduce the peak load during those hours. Uruguay in the past built thermal power plants from firm capacity. The increase in the share of renewables in the electricity matrix lowered the need of firm capacity. We should adapt our legal framework and regulation for this new reality. We need long-term policy, stable policy. It is needed also to differentiate costs for firm demand from flexible demand. Firm demand is generated by customers that need availability of electricity the whole time, the whole time. Flexible demand are customers that can be disconnected when there is congestion in the grid or when there is not enough energy. Finally, we need to develop instruments in which private investors could rely on. As was in the first energy transition, certainty is the key aspect to promote energy intensive, flexible demand investments. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much to all the speakers. It has been a very interesting session. I'm going to start with a couple of questions for Helen Plum. The first question is, are there countries who are signatory of the Paris Agreement who are going against the agreement? Well, th thank you for the question. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's um, up up to me to um, say whether countries are or are not in line um, with the agreement. However, um, I, I think what we're seeing is that addressing climate change is, is quite a challenging thing for countries to do. And um, I, I think countries, for the most part, um, their intentions are in the right direction. And until countries start actually reporting on their their actions under the Paris Agreement, I think we won't have a, a particularly a full picture of what countries are doing. But um, I, I don't think I, I, I would say that countries are, are um, going against the Paris Agreement because I, I think that is perhaps um, for, for others to draw conclusions on. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the other question is, what are the key aspects or challenges to consider when developing a national emission systems? And how do we integrate those systems with international mechanisms? Or what's the role of international cooperation to achieve that? Um, a very good question. Um, I think, first of all, a national system um, for greenhouse gas emissions is, is really about the um, having the right arrangements in place, what we call institutional arrangements for reporting. And this is a um, where each country decides for itself who will um, take the responsibility for coordinating at, um, the, the greenhouse gas inventory itself, um, who which part of government does which part of, of the um, the inventory. For example, in New Zealand, our um, agency that deals with energy statistics does the energy sector part. And similarly for agriculture, our um, 
Ministry for Primary Industries um, takes prime responsibility for that. But we have um, in place legislation that makes the Ministry for the Environment ultimately responsible for coordinating the whole process and, and um, reporting the product to the UNFCCC. So I, I think um, that's it's working with, with what you have and, and building on that and um, then seeing whether what you have domestically meets the um, international guidelines for such things and then building building a system as you go. And um, I, I think um, the, the key aspect is, is um, understanding, I guess, that the product that comes out of this is just as relevant for um, national or domestic purposes as it is for international purposes. And um, because of that dual aspect, I think the two things fit very well together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Alfonso Blanco now. Uh, is an impact for climate change already seen or foreseen on hydropower in the Latin American region in general, and especially in Brazil? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the question. Yes, uh, we, we have uh, developed a lot of uh, studies regarding the impact of the climate change in the uh, hydropower generation around the all Latin, Latin American region. Uh, the first the first study that we uh, did uh, uh, with Olade and uh, and the ADB was for the Central American region that has a very uh, high penetration of the hydro hydropower in the energy matrix of the of the region. Second, uh, we performed the the same uh, study for the Andinian region with the the same results. The the hydropower generation is very uh, is very affected affect, affected by the the climate change uh, change uh, in the in the in the region due to the changes in the uh, rain rain periods in the, in our in our region and due to uh, uh, some vulnerability that uh, the hydropower generation has has in the in the in the region now. We are presenting the same the same study for the southern cone, uh, with focus in the Paraná, uh, Paraná and uh, and Uruguay rivers, uh, for mo most most of them uh, for the uh, hydro hydro power generation uh, bilat uh, bilateral projects that are uh, uh, between uh, Bra Brazil and Paraguay, Paraguay and Argentina, and uh, Uruguay Uruguay and Argentina. Uh, and uh, we believe that the the results of the study uh, will uh, show the same the same results uh, that we we had in the in the Central American and the in the Andean region that our uh, installations are very vulnerable for uh, the clim uh, climate change uh, uh, projections projections for the uh, for the for the region. We are we are already already see the impacts the, the impacts in the uh, Brazilian uh, hydropower hydropower generation, but each uh, uh, region should be analyzed uh, separately because uh, each uh, uh, hydro hydro systems are related to each uh, particular particular geographical uh, geographical. Uh, situation and what are the rivers that are involved in the in each uh, particular particular hydropower generation? Uh, thank you, Alfonso. Uh, to Mario Menel, uh, would you like to comment on this? Uh, is is there an impact for climate change already seen or foreseen in, in for hydropower in Brazil? Thanks for the the question. Yes, I would like to compliment. Uh, as shown in my presentation, we have uh, observed uh, uh, affluent flows below the, 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 the average for the long term for the last seven years. So uh, we foreseen problems in our operation model. We have uh, uh, multiple uh, uses for the water in our, our reservoirs. 
So uh, it's a, it's a concern to to keep the level of the the water in in high level. But uh, the big question is who is going to pay for that because we need to to decrease the gener the power generation uh, of the hydropower plants and in that case to to give uh, conditions to the transport to the human being uh, uh, supply of water uh, we need to to apply penalties to the, the, the hydroelectric uh, generators at this uh, framework that we have now. So we need to, to, to avoid this uh, changing the way to operate our reservoirs. That's a big challenge for us. Not now because you are in the middle of a crisis, but uh, next year, for sure, we need to, to try to, to have a new model to operate our uh, electrical system. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Jose Luis Fernandez Salas. Uh, the audience is asking, how do you think uh, it is possible to ensure stability of the electricity distribution system with a foreseen very high percentage of solar energy. Uh, Jose Luis, uh, as you know, in Zoom, <laughs> you are mute. Excuse me. Uh, uh, as it has uh, already been said, the, uh, the question is not a technical. Uh, uh, the prices are right. <laughs> the uh, coming of uh, solar and wind energy uh, is because of economic pressure mostly, but uh, the need for, for stability has not been addressed properly. I don't think there is a technical problem or a hurdle to, uh, to face that stability by storage uh, systems like uh, water pumping, for example, or condensers or batteries or whatever. The problem is more, mostly financial. So this, our, my country is, is working in uh, stabilizing the uh, 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 legal issues and the right of way issues and so forth, so that uh, foreign investment can be called in to, to, to deal with the stability problem. I think that's uh, going to be a big business in Mexico within the next three or four years. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, I have a question now for Oscar Vignard, which relates to the a forecast that the uh, cars will become electrical. So it, there will, should be an impact in gasoline demand in the petroleum industry in general. If, what do you think that the strategies of adaptation would be for the industry? Well, the substitution of, uh, you know, internal combustion engine by electric uh, you know, vehicles, uh, it will be done in, in a period of time and will not be done instantaneously. Uh, in the world, there is a stock of around one, one billion vehicles moved by gasoline today or diesel. So the, to replace, this will take many years. So I think that this transition will give enough time for refineries to adapt to a decreasing, uh, you know, uh, supply of gasoline and diesel. No? So I think there is time to take the proper measures to adapt, uh, you know, the oil refining industry to this scenario. This is not instantaneous. It would take many years. Hey, thank you. I have a question for Federico Ferres. Uh, Renewables are, are not a, a firm source of energy, and as you said, uh, demand uh, could be also modulated through economic instruments in, in order to better adapt to the characteristics of the supply. Uh, could you elaborate more on which economic instruments can be used for that? Would just uh, different tariffs for energy, different costs during the day or something like that, be useful because uh, usually uh, 
production of renewables, uh, especially for wind or solar, cannot be guaranteed more than a few days ahead. Uh, yes, Julio, uh, excellent question. I think that is a key uh, for the uh, development of new renewal in, in Uruguay, to, ha to have the possibility to create a demand that can adapt itself to the variability of the power generation, meaning that can demand more energy when there is, when there is more availability of, of resources. Um, the key aspect, aspect for that is to have a, a good, well, first, good data in order to, for the demand to, to, to make the, the choices when the data, when the, uh, the, the generation is available. And second, to generate a dif to differentiate the the cost of the energy for those th that demand that is that will uh, only demand when there is availability. Uh, there is a lot of uses now. We are seeing support uh, the hydrogen. We are uh, some batteries, and there will be a lot of development for this uh, new demand. This demand will not. Uh, uh, be installed if the price of energy is uh, like it is today in the in the country. Uh, we we have to create incentives. Suppose uh, the transmission grid today has a lot of extra capacity during a certain time of the day. If demand use the same transmission system, then maybe it can be it can be costless or minimal cost in order for the use of the transmission system. Second, the capacity market today costs money, but if demand uh, avoids capacity, avoids the need of using energy the whole time, then you can avoid charging capacity to this new demand. And these two aspects today, maybe 50, 60 or 70 percent of the cost of the energy. So if we can reduce the cost to, the demand, to this new demand of, tar of, of the transmission lines and the capacity market, then there is High, the, the chance of this new demand, new loads of installing in Uruguay will be higher. So yes, I think that we need to, to regulate in a way to, to have different uh, uh, prices for the demand that is capable of adapting itself to the variability of the renewables. Okay, well, thank you very much, Federico. Uh, we are closing uh, now the, the period of question and answer sessions. I have to thank again all the speakers, all the members of the audience that have submitted questions. Uh, obviously, our region has a big challenge ahead in order to meet the demand and supply needs of the, of the future. Uh, I'm going to, to close this uh, session and answer, uh, giving our thanks to the organizing committee. And now we, uh, we go to the closing remarks by uh, Manuel Solanet. So thank you very much, everybody. And Dear participants of this meeting, it's not easy to summarize in 10 minutes what we discussed in three days. Anyway, I will try to give you some highlights. Our opener plenary left us the following message. There are huge energy resources, but also big challenges. The target is to grow and simultaneously to reduce carbon emissions. There are three steps were recommended to reduce emissions. 
in the next 10 years, will massively use existing technologies. I mean, solar, wind, hydro, more efficiency also. After 2030, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, small reactors. International collaboration among countries is a must. Energy policies need to be tailored to local resources and barriers. Renewals are not pilot projects anymore. Now they need to be deployed at scale. Institutional and government capacities might be key for the energy transition. There is a large potential for investment. Cost. Session one was, was focused on new trends in energy demand. There is no limit in low carbon resources. Therefore, the challenge lies in how to decouple the growth in consumption from greenhouse gas emissions. The use of the best available technology without awaiting the new ones seems highly advisable. Energy efficiency and electrification are the two main drivers of the carbonization of the building sector in the 2050 net, net zero emissions. Key enablers include laws and regulation, financial and economic incentives for energy efficiency and zero emission investment. Labeling and public awareness campaign to foster behavioral change and increase the cooperation between governments, private sector, and civil society. The electric vehicles market is rapidly expanding, and so is the need for advanced battery technology. Grid edge technology is increasing with and in turn promoting the decentralization of electricity systems. There is an increasing prevalence, prevalence of local and community energy models and virtual power plants alongside the rapid development of electric vehicle use. Customer preferences and related social aspects are key to development of grid edge technology. The Green New Deal policy comprises four dimensions. First, energy supply, large-scale offshore wind, power, and solar photovoltaic plants. Second, infrastructure, microgrid, and green hub station for renewable energy and flexible grid. Third, customer preference, 100% renewable electronics by 2050. And four, market reforms and development. The main message from session two that deal with nuclear energy are the International Atomic Energy Agency must act quickly to combat climate change. As the use of wind and solar energy increases, nuclear should gradually replace thermal power generation that provides stability and flexibility to the electric system. Currently, 51 reactors are under construction worldwide that's a lot. Regarding the Chinese experience, the aim is to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. One of the presentations was devoted to CAREM, Argentina's small modular reactor, completely designed and built in Argentina. We are proud of it. Session three on renewable left us the following message. Sorry. In the context of the decarbonization agenda, renewable energy plays a pivotal role. This session provided an up-to-date view of the current and future development of renewable energy technology. Also covered the supply requirements and prospects of sustained minerals that will play a key role to support the transition towards cleaner energy systems. The use of complex energy system models is key to optimize new technology selection and investment decision making. Even if energy storage is still in the beginning, the use of batteries has shown great progress. The cost of recoverable batteries still needs to be reduced significantly. Among existing technology, the lithium ion battery has experienced worldwide acceptance and success expected to increase 13 times in the next 10 years, the requirement for lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, and phosphorus 
will experience a step change with core civil supply shortage in the short and medium term. South America has a key role to play, especially in lithium. Argentina has a big reserve on lithium. The experience and plans of Japan, the European Union, and Spain in the use and, and development of hydrogen, hydrogen was reviewed. Hydrogen is deemed to play a key role in the decarbonization of energy systems, in the production, transportation, storage, and utilization segment. Cost reduction is the greatest challenge to ensure the successful adoption of hydrogen. Spain has a long-term plan for the development of biofuels that should supply 10% of the energy requirements in the transportation sector by 2030. The Uruguay experience provides an interesting case of massive contribution of wind and solar power generation complementary with hydroelectricity. Session four focus on oil and gas and left us the following message. The convergence to carbon neutral economies will vary by, by and depend on different political, economic and social circumstances at both regional and national level. International regulation should not discriminate against certain technologies or fuels and allow these to compete. Oil and gas exporters and importers to develop burden sharing mechanisms and integrate them into multilateral and bilateral framework. Oil and gas exporting countries need to show leadership in emissions mitigation technology. Natural gas will become the second pillar of recarbonization alongside renewable power, mostly through coal replacement, facilitation for electric vehicle adoption, power generation backup for wind and solar, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen manufacturing, and methane emission reduction resulting from clean air initiatives. Early action based on existing technology is a key. Gas and hydrogen are destined, destined to become infrastructure partners. Nature-based solutions can create significant synergies in emission reductions and carbon sequestration without increasing energy costs to end users. On technology side, the present start on a process of carbon capture, utilization and storage measures, as well as low carbon transfer option was reduced in depth. Section five, yes, with education and engineering, and it left the following message. Engineering is one of the key professions that shape our world. This session provides examples of how new disciplines such as system thinking, artificial intelligence, and dynamic modeling are forming new generation of engineers that are better prepared to face the complexities of our times. It has been the permanent interest of case to increase the preference of young people for engineering, and particularly women. We agree that the fears and aversions towards the hard science must be dispelled. Equal opportunities in the professional practice must be given without discriminating by gender. We heard how artificial intelligence is changing both what and how we teach with immense potential to improve learning and provide better support to teachers and administrators. The experience of training students with the Android Climate Action Simulator showed the effectiveness of these tools in raising climate change awareness. Engineers students explain why they choose their discipline. Their ideas and enthusiasm are a source of inspiration and hope regarding the social contribution of our profession can make. This closing plenary that most focuses in Latin American energy overview, among others, is led us to the following message. Latin America is a region with abundant and diverse, diverse energy resources, characterized by dynamic market growth. Oil, natural gas, and hydroelectricity play a key role in energy supply. Nuclear energy has been developed only in a few cases. Wind and solar energy are rapidly expanding and need to be deployed a larger scale, posing some technical and financial challenges. National energy policies vary according to local circumstances and needs. 
Itu sana dan kebenaran capabilities are not always ideal. And will be key to manage energy transition. There is a large potential for international investment and cooperation. I hope you enjoy the meeting we made in these three days. It was a strong effort for us, believe me. And I appreciate what you help. I mean, all the academies in case to produce this. I also want to take here the thanks of all the people who work for us in this meeting, mainly the team who organized, headed by Oscar Vignar, the company MCA who give us technology, and all the people who support these days with us here to, to produce this meeting as you, as, you, as you see. Well, now I have the pleasure to hand the floor to Pascal Bigenier, President of the National Academy of Technologies of France, who will brief us on CAGE 2022 to be in Paris. All us, we hope to be in Paris next year. Pascal, will we play? On behalf of uh, all our colleagues from the CAITS member academies, I would like to express uh, our congratulations and sincere thanks to the Academia Nacional de Ingenieria for the successful organization of this year event in a very special conditions and constraints. Dear President Manuel Solani, please convey our warm thanks to your team for this successful organization. I take this opportunity to express our gratitude to Ruth, Ruth Davis for her uh, tremendous commitment and efforts to make CADS work better and better every year. So CADS 2022 is coming now and we will be happy to welcome you uh, next year 26 to 30th of September. Next slide. It will take place in Paris, very close to Paris, in Versailles, uh, 20, uh, 17 kilometers far from Paris in southwest. So very close. Next slide. And Versailles is well known by his famous castle, Chateau de Versailles, uh, built by the King Louis XIV, named uh, King the Sun, Roi Soleil. Another view, next slide, of this castle with the statue of the, the king. And I, you will have the opportunity to see it and, of course, to visit it. Next slide will present you the place where the CADS 2022 will take place.
So I've just seen rapidly uh, this will be taking place in the Palais des Congrès, the Congress Palais of Versailles, uh, freshly renewed, uh, very close to the uh, Versailles uh, Castle. Next slide. The main theme of the uh, previous slide, the main theme of the um, KS 2022 will be engineering a better world in the domain of healthcare, breakthrough technology for healthcare, COVID situation, but many other issues will inspire us to build uh, this focus on breakthrough technology for healthcare. I won't go much detail today. Uh, on this slide, you see the main person organizing uh, this event, uh, the program manager, deputy uh, 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 president for international is Gérard Crozet, and is uh, preparing this event very carefully, uh, weekly. Uh, and tomorrow, Bruno Revenefelkoz, our uh, NATF delegate for foreign affairs, will present in the council the a more detailed program to all of you. So I really uh, look forward to welcoming you physically, but probably also virtually, but I hope mostly physically in this case 2022 in Paris and Versailles.